Hello again, neighbors and naysayers. This is Clint Finney for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk for August the 27th, 2020. This month, we went and visited the farm of Hans and Brittany Balchley up in Stark County. For those of you that were with us last October, we visited their farm then, and uh, because of the time change in the waning daylight, we didn't have a whole lot of they like to be able to see a lot of the farm, so we thought it was a good idea to, to go back and take a look and also to see how their farm is dealing with the current dry weather that we've been having. So let's get started. Before we really get into everything that we've looked at there at Hans and Brittany's place, uh, we do want to apologize. Uh, it was a very busy schedule this summer. Uh, we had just one day to go up to Hans's and, and take a look at things and we usually like to shoot several videos to put in with these virtual pasture walks but that one day that we had to go up there and visit it was very very windy and uh, our videos just don't shoot very well in the in windy uh, areas it ends up just being a lot of wind and you can't hardly hear our voice so you're gonna have to uh, visualize the farm through still pictures for this month but uh, as always beth did a wonderful job of taking good quality pictures up there uh, and, and be able to show uh, exactly what it is that hans has going on we'll go ahead and get the cow herd out of the way uh hans's cows mostly angus based type cows but i, I think uh, I, I, I never like to talk about numbers and, and all those things that go into cow herds. We're all cow producers. Numbers to me don't matter much, but uh, I asked Hans and he said about 20 cow calf pairs there on the farm. Um, but the interesting thing is Hans was involved in 4-H and, and showed steers and, and had some cows that had some size to them. And over the past several years, he's got some Angus influence and some Scottish type Angus cows that are smaller made, uh, more grass efficient kind of cows. He's used some semen from them uh, to make those kind of cows. And it's kind of interesting to see the difference. I, I can know in Hans and, and talking cows with him quite a bit. I can walk through the cow herd and kind of pick out those cows that have a little bit of Scottish influence to them. But that's a direct result of, of working with grazing animals and, and realizing that those smaller type cows and are a little more efficient, a little more grass efficient for his operation. He's still got some bigger cows, some some showier kind of cows, uh, but it's kind of cool to see those, those smaller made kind of grass efficient cows that are out there with the herd. But I thought we probably need to talk about cows as we're there at a beef operation. Well, I know a lot of you that tune into these pasture walks uh, like to see the cows and like to talk about the cow herd a little bit. One of the many unique features uh, about their farm is that they've got a lot of wet areas <clears throat> and uh, it's it's unique for me because I come from the southern end of the grazing council area where we're really, really droughting. We don't have a whole lot of wet areas. Uh, Hans place is, is kind of <clears throat> dominated by both wet and rather droughty areas at the same time. and those wet areas have been challenging in the last two years with the, the rainfalls that we had the last two years. Uh, you could almost not use them. Han said, I, I had to, I had to use them. I did use them, but I didn't use them as often in the last two years as I've used them this year. Those wet areas have provided weeks worth of grazing this year because they're sort of sub irrigated and, and that's been enough forage for Hans to be able to go on to those areas, graze those areas, and they're not wet, so they're not plugging them up, and be able to come back off of those wet areas and go back to the, the droughtier areas, leave them to go there 45 or 60 days to be able to recover and be able to be grazed again. Now, those wet areas uh, are also challenging in that the forage they produce a lot of times it isn't the best quality. It's got a lot of yellow nut sedge in it and a couple other sedges and things. Uh, Han said when he moved there uh, in the state that the farm was in, a lot of it actually had some patches of cattails here and there that, that aren't there anymore because of his management, because he's been able to manage those as actual pasture areas. But 
Um, part of the challenges of Eastern Ohio Grazing Council is the diverse landscapes that we cover. Uh, we go all the way from the northern Mahoning County areas where there's lots of these wet areas to, to the southern end where I'm from that's rather droughty. Uh, and I guess in the wet years, we really curse those wet areas. But in the dry years, uh, they can, can kind of become our savior as far as forage production goes. So uh, for those of you that have wet areas and and kind of consider them challenging to, to manage, realize that those of us in the drier areas of the world really wish for those wetter areas uh, in years like this. As I was thinking about going and doing a pasture walk at, at their place, um, I, I thought one of the cool things to maybe include in this pasture walk is uh, their weather station. And this is something I know absolutely nothing about but uh, Brittany bought Hans this weather station for Christmas last year and he put it out here on a post and of course covered it with an electric wire to keep the cows from messing with it but this thing works uh, through his Wi-Fi to put it into a site that he can he can get to through his phone or on the internet anywhere he has a connection so he can sit at his office in, in New Philadelphia and look at his weather station and whether it's raining currently at their place or how much rain they got for that day. It also tabulates the weather conditions for the month and year if you keep up with it. And Hans can even share a link that, that links directly to his weather station to be able to show the weather that they've had there at their particular farm. I think this is a cool system. I, I, I see a day coming when a lot of us are going to have these. Uh, and especially in the current weather pattern we've been in where the rains have been so spotty, it would be nice for all of us to be able to have a, a weather station like this to be able to, to say, okay, we got this much rain. And, and I, honestly, I see a day coming when uh, some of the drought programs could be tied to, to these weather stations and, and how much rain we, we show. I know for my place uh, down on the river, all the weather stations are close to the river. The river gets rain a lot more often than the uplands do. So having a weather station to be able to show how much rain we've got and how much rain we've been able to keep and, and also being able to plan on that and know how much forage those rainfalls will bring us in the summer uh, could be a valuable piece of information for our operation. So I thought it was cool to, to, to implement this into our pasture walk and get you guys all thinking about these handy little weather stations. I thought also one of the cool things to highlight at Hans place is, is that he's not afraid in any way to, to buy some new and varying seeds and species of, of things that spread out there on his operation and see how things go. We talk quite often about, uh, we're not sure how much good it did us, but it's really cool to see some of those new and differing species kind of growing there. And, and, and I guess his kind of leadership on that has led me down the road of, of planting some seeds that I wouldn't normally plant out there on the farm. So. Uh, I thought I wanted to highlight that, that, that he's kind of pushed me to do some things on my place that I normally wouldn't do. But I guess the end goal is always, like we talk about it, is we, we try different species and we, we try to see what will eventually take hold and what will actually work. And, and maybe one of these things that we try will become a, a sort of sub in our pasture field and, and hopefully an improved variety that will, will be a subdominant kind of species. You know, we're always going to have orchard grass and fescue. Hans is always going to have reed canary grass and a couple other things up there on his place, but kind of implementing some new and different forage species. So uh, this, <clears throat> he, he has planted some, some chicory up there. He's planted some plantain up there. Uh, as far as perennials go, uh, he's planted some reed canary grass and, and that being improved reed canary grass. Uh, in some of those wetter areas to be able to see if he can get it to grow. Uh, as always, um, frost seeded some clover. Uh, Hans always spreads some Italian rye like I do in the spring uh, just to kind of get something growing or if he has some berries in the fall even he uses Italian rye grass to, to seed out there in the field. But uh, 
kind of taken some of those improved species and like i said these are all improved species of, of forages it's not your not the chicory that we see growing out there right now it's actual forage chicory it's not the reed canary grass that you all up there in the, the northern parts of the grazing council see growing in the road ditch it's reed canary grass that was improved and and, and made for grazing but taking those out and spreading those in those areas at the times when they'll they'll go ahead and get seed seed the soil contact and go ahead and grow and then waiting a couple of years to see whether they do any good or not or whether they're going to to be a part of our pasture species in the end here again uh hans has also put out some annuals out there in his pasture field and uh, <clears throat> he last year uh spread sorghum sedan grass on a, a pasture field that he was grazing uh, didn't spread it with a drill just broadcast it out let the kind of cattle hoof action push the seed in uh, and then grazed it again 20 or 28 days later and then come 45 50 days after seeding he had a beautiful stand a sorghum sedan growing in that field uh, as we talked earlier in the year this really wasn't the year for that uh, we didn't have enough rainfall and moisture enough wet ground to be able to get it tramped in but uh again under his leadership i've kind of done some of that at home and kind of done some experiments with sorghum sedan now this year very different from last year very dry but what i i found so far is, is that uh we worry too much about getting sorghum sedan planted deep in the ground some of the lighter places that that the drill went over at home is actually the better stands of sorghum sedan grass that i have so i th i think we could do some serious research here uh, with the way Hans did it the first year and, and just spreading it out and tracking it in with the cows. Now, I will say the fertility in this field that where he did it um, was a whole lot better than most of the, the fertility in most of our pasture fields. So probably part of the reason why he got such a great stand too. But uh, again, just using some of these annuals and, and you may consider Italian ryegrass sort of an annual. It's a biennial, but it does seed and it does come back. So uh, but using some of these annuals to kind of put out there in our pasture field and kind of extend our grazing season, uh, a great idea and something Hans has been good about kind of doing some research and figuring out what will work and what won't work and, and just going ahead and trying it. So often I get questions in the office about, uh, well, can we do this or can we do that? And I say, you know, the best thing you can do is buy some seed and try it. And see whether it works or not don't don't invest your whole farm in it don't don't invest money enough that it's going to hurt if if it doesn't work but go out there and try it we've got the time let's see whether it'll work or whether it won't work just another annual that hans has planted out there in the field this is a daikon tillage radish and i know we've talked about these over the summer but hans's idea here sort of with the radishes this is in a wetter area and he's kind of hoping maybe those tillage radishes will drill a hole down in those wetter areas. Most of our wetter areas are silty, kind of up uh, the upper layers of the soil, and, and most of them have a sort of hard clay layer below there somewhere. And so the, the theory here is maybe get that radish to poke a hole down into that silty stuff and, and give it some area to drain to, and, and really hoping maybe it'll poke some hole through that hard clay layer that tillage layer that might be under there and hopefully dry those areas up and, and do it sort of in a natural kind of way but some of the other annuals i, I know i talked a lot about sorghum sedan and, and hans has this daikon tillage radishes planted out there he, he's used some turnips and uh, a bunch of other varying annuals some of them perennials that we found are going to be annuals but uh just just to try out some different some different annuals some of them will reseed some of them will come back some like these radishes and turnips won't uh, but just a, a good way to try annuals out there and and for a purpose not only for grazing maybe to extend the grazing season or just to give uh just an extra thing out there to graze but also with these tillage radishes uh helps hopefully help with the drainage in that particular field as we're talking about annual plantings and the, the sorghum sedan that Hans planted out there, one, one of the things that we've talked about since uh, last fall when that sorghum sedan was done is Hans is sure that that sorghum sedan had an effect on the perennial forage there in that field. He said that once the 
frost came and that was all grazed off, the orchard grass and, and other perennial species in that field was just as good as the forage everywhere else and, and maybe just a little bit better. And he said it continued into this spring. Uh, that field was greener, lusher, thicker than the rest of the farm. And uh, I, I guess we're contributing that to the fact that that sorghum sedan is real high sugar. And when it frosted and died out, it kind of releases that sugar back to the soil. And that could show up as fertility to the other perennial species for sure. But we're, we're kind of thinking that it's, it's also helped to feed the soil health, to feed the, the bugs, the microbes in the soil and get some additional activity out there in that field. So one of the side benefits of doing all of those annuals or doing annuals in your pasture field or diversity in your pasture field, I guess, is, is the increased uh, activity to the soil health, to the microbes uh, that then are gonna produce additional forage in, in the years to come. And uh, we're, we're just touching the surface of this. We, we're not even sure that that's, that's for real, but uh, he, he had a marked difference though in the forage production and the quality of forage after that sorghum sedan grass was out there on the field. And I mean, he could see it uh, visually out across the farm this, this spring where the sorghum sedan was planted and where it wasn't, even though there was no sorghum sedan left. Hans has been slowly uh, getting the water system in. I know he'll chuckle when he hears me say slowly, but he does it as he has time uh, and as he has the resources available to be able to get a water system in across the entire farm. So some of the farm is watered by uh, gravity fed water. Some of it's pressurized water and, and seems like about every year he puts in a stretch of pipeline and another trough and puts in a different place. And there is nothing wrong with that. Actually, it works out because you, you learn quickly where you really need the water and where you don't. And where, where if we're just looking at it on a map, a lot of times we say, well, we need it here, here, and here. And if we're gonna do it under some cost incentive program, we've got a pretty tight timeline for when we've got to get things installed. But doing it slow and, and getting things done uh, when you need them and, and where you need them sometimes isn't the, best, the, the worst option. Uh, because you, you really think hard whether you do you really need a trough there or, or do you really need a pipeline there or what will work the best and how can we make that field work the best. But this is just a, a, a tire trough that's pressurized water, has a job float in it and, and an overflow that he can pull out and drain the tank, clean the tank. Again, um, Hans has kind of experimented with some things up there as far as troughs go. Uh, rather than putting wet mixed concrete in this tire uh, he just put dry bag sackcrete turned the water on very slowly kept it from dripping on the dry concrete let the water trough fill up and cover that concrete and it sealed that tire uh, without mixing concrete and if anybody's ever put in a, a tire trough you know that's probably that wet concrete mixed and down there because it doesn't take a whole truckload it just takes what can be hand mixed but it's a lot of work to hand mix it so uh, again a good use of both pressurized and gravity fed water there at his place to be able to get water out to the cows and and he's got kind of a set permanent set of panics that he works through but because he has these pressurized troughs he can subdivide those set permanent panics up further especially in the spring when they really need to be split up. And then come this fall when uh, we're all using kind of bigger pastures and a longer rotation, you can kind of just set back and rely on those permanent pastures that are out there. As we walked up the hill to look at the source of the, the spring development that kind of feeds the farm uh, as far as gravity water goes, uh, it was kind of brought to my attention that because of all this dry weather, um, we, we depend on the springs and the wells and the things that we water livestock with and uh, it doesn't take it to get much drier than this at home that uh, things start going dry and, and I kind of lose a lot of flexibility at the farm and I, I forget that I forget that through the wet years and into the dry years and and just a, a public service announcement here for all of you that are watching this 
probably a good idea to go start checking your springs, to start checking your well every so often, making sure everything's flowing right and still going the way that it should. Uh, some of the groundwater that we deal with for, for stock water, some of that's delayed up to eight months or so uh, from the dry period. So we can actually be back into a high rainfall time and our groundwater supply is still rather slow because it's not instantaneous, it's not immediate. So a, a good idea to go up and, and check your springs, check your wells, uh, check your troughs, see how fast they're recovering. Uh, before we set into winter here, especially because winter for me, I try to ch tend to choose an area to unroll hay on. Uh, if I get a week or two into unrolling hay and then find out that that water source isn't good enough to keep, keep the cows through, I'm going to have to switch and go somewhere else. And so effectively then I've kind of um, tore up uh, an additional area that I didn't really need to tear up. Uh, so a good idea to go check your springs. Hans says this spring that's about as low as he's ever seen it run. And it's still running five gallons a minute or in excess of five gallons a minute. So probably still good with the number of livestock they have there, but a good idea to go check your springs, check your water sources, make sure that they're still flowing, that they're not getting worse. Uh, and then we're gonna have enough water to continue to graze. One other uh, topic we kind of touched on while we were there walking the farm with Hans is, uh, it, it just put this new kind of spring gate in this field. And it reminded me just to, to talk a little bit about flexibility. We so often uh, talk about pasture systems and we have kind of two camps in the grazing world of between permanent paddock divisions and temporary paddock divisions or temporary fence. And uh, even those of us who use a lot of temporary fence still rely on some permanent paddock divisions out there in the field. I, I wouldn't be able to, to graze the way I do without the, the paddock divisions that I have. I've got fields that are 16, 20 acres that I break further up with permanent or with temporary fence, uh, but we do have those permanent divisions. And Hans's place is, is sort of the same way. He's got uh, permanent paddock divisions, some of them are polywire, some of them are high tensile, that's, that break the farm up, but then he uses uh, temporary polywire to be able to split the fields up further. The, the issue we get into with permanent uh, paddock divisions is that uh, we so often then are kind of set with where the, the livestock can come in and come out because of the gates and things. And, and Hans says, I went ahead and put this gate in. I didn't think I needed it when I built the fence. Didn't think I needed it when I was doing gates the last time. But I decided, you know, I'm going to put this in here and see how it works. And he said, this has made all the difference in this field because now I can make the rotation a little easier. I don't have to drive back through uh, this particular field to get back to the gate to come back out. It doesn't make a dead end. It makes somewhere that I can bring them out this gate. And, and so often, if we have trouble moving livestock, uh, it's because we don't have the gate in the right place. Uh, we didn't think about flexibility and flow through our grazing system to be able to get them through. I've got several places at home, gates in the wrong side, gates on the wrong in the wrong place. There's a curve in the fence and the gates on the wrong side of the curve. Uh, so often we don't think about going back and changing those things because, oh, that's a permanent fence. Yeah, it's a permanent fence, but it doesn't mean that we can't go back and drive two brace posts uh, and be able to put a gate in there and, and make things flex a lot better. One of the ideas I got long ago from an Eastern Ohio crazy cow patch to walk over at Ken Clark's is that uh, if it may take us an extra five minutes of time to be able to move cows because we didn't do it right. But if we change it and do it right, it may take us eight hours that day to fix it. But that eight hours over the next 10 years is going to be easy to come up with because we're not fighting those cows to be able to move this way or that way. So I tend to go back and, and change some things. And that's what Hans has done here is just to make things more fallable, to make it easier to manage. Uh, he just put this gate in here and he said it's made all the difference in the grazing rotation this summer. As we were walking around the farm and looking for things to take pictures of and shoot, Hans says, well, would you like to go down and take a look at my pollinator area? And I said, did you plant some pollinator area? And he says, no, I, I just left it to be a pollinator area. And what this is, is, is the ditch area that's fenced off. He's got the cows fenced out of the stream, but that area is completely covered now in uh, doe pie and goldenrod and lots of other pollinator species. 
and, and that's something that Hans has kind of done over the whole farm. Uh, we talked when we were there about clipping, and, and he was holding back from clipping because he had lots of milkweed on the farm until that first set of monarchs really came through, and, and he's left some, some milkweed around the farm to be able to to <clears throat> keep a refuge for those butterflies and pollinators as they come through. So uh, just a, a another way to think about the areas that we fence out uh, and and what they're really good for. So often we have farmers say, well, I don't want to fence that out. It's, it's not going to be good, any good for anything then. Well, in reality, uh, it's low productive ground. It, it's going to cause us a problem in the long run with cattle in there. So I guess it's best to see kind of the silver lining in fencing those areas out. And we're providing a refuge then for the pollinator species, for the butterflies, for all those things that are going to benefit our pasture in the long run. We, we so often don't think about the benefit that those pollinators do for us. But anybody that can walk through a, a red clover field in bloom and see all those pollinators out there, if you think real hard, uh, you can think of how much good those pollinators are really doing us in a, a pasture situation. Well, that's a wrap for this month's virtual pasture walk. We'll end, as always, by thanking our sponsors. And also a big thank you to Hans and Brittany for allowing us to come up and uh, walk around their place, take some pictures, talk with them about the operation. We do appreciate it. These months here of July and August and September are always very busy for us here at NRCS and Solar Water. And it's nice to be able to go to an operation that we, we know and that we talk about and, and that we, we understand what they're doing and, and we can do a lot of this virtual stuff by memory and over the phone. Uh, to be able to show you guys uh, what we talk about sometimes here in the office. So we do appreciate it, Hans, and uh, we'll see you next time.